Hey guys, welcome to The Secret History, living in your aquarium. So what we're going to talk about right here real quick is what we have from frozen food that you can feed your fish. Now this is one of my favorites. This is uh, frozen baby brine shrimp, and these little half cubes, they're 36 mini cubes. One, they're good because they don't have a lot of bio uh, waste or material, um, basically just you know decomposing matter. Uh, that turns into ammonia or detritus that's going to cause issues with your parameters and your nitrates and nitrites. But also, they're really fine uh, level uh, brine shrimp. They're very teeny. They're immediately like one or two day hatch brine shrimp. And in fact, I just put them in this cup of tank water, which is about 78 degrees. So I scoop it out of a tank uh, so that it's not tap water. And then I dissolve these cubes and I make a slurry and then I've got one for my little fish and one for my bigger fish that I do in different successions about every second or third day of the week. But basically these little mini cubes turn into this, this uh, dusting or floating little dots in here. That's how teeny it is in a red solo cup 16 ounce here's my here's my hands uh and then we've got another option which are Mises shrimp and a lot of times these get fed to saltwater fish too so sometimes they'll say for salt water but generally they're they're for both and uh these ones um are are definitely they're still mostly water if you see that uh, 92%. So that's kind of a bummer about some of these things. You can order away with brine shrimp direct and get dry food that's a whole heck of a lot more uh, bang for your buck than some of these wet and frozen foods, but a lot of fish won't accept those. So it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a give and take situation. But this stuff looks a little more freezer burned, and it's not. It's just a, a matter of that's what Mises shrimp look like. And when we look at them here in the cup, you can see the size of them there uh, is, you know, relatively uh, relatively small still. They're not like uh, sea monkeys grown up there. They're this, this one here. You can see some pieces coming off, and that's like a full-grown one right there that's kind of been shredded a little bit. But still, it's maybe half a centimeter or so. And you can even make out some of the little brine shrimp actually look like little brine shrimp. Can you see them now that they're floating there? Um, so, in any case, always fresh live is the best, but who has time and money and space for all of that? Um, you know, it's not a lot of people. So let's be realistic about our feeding process. So, yeah, the Mises shrimp, and I usually look, and I, you know, for each tank that's like 10 or 20 gallon, I'll usually do one cube for every two tanks or something like that. Let it dissolve into the water, and then I'll use a turkey baster or a pipette and squirt that into the water, and it diffuses it nicely. So then we've got the next level up size of the brine shrimp or uh, that you can have, which look like little brine shrimp um <laughs> i mean i know that doesn't help the description all that much but um that's that's what they are and i don't have the package handy because we've gone through them all but uh they're they're a good option for mid-sized fish for angelfish or um, rams or you know larger danios barbs things like that i'm saying mid-size in the aquarium world but then we've got bloodworms, and you can get these small cubes, which generally have some full-size bloodworms and some kind of um, masticated already or mushed and cut. Uh, so these are nice, the smaller cubes, in that one, obviously, you can just have them like this, or you can buy, I've got in the freezer too, these big old flat bars that are up to, you know, several pounds if you want of them but they're bigger and also they can get kind of freezer burned and start to look like empty hollow tubes of clear uh protein or casein basically which isn't very appetizing to your fish but when you look at these you can see that the blood worms still have quite a bit of shape to them and texture and there's also some like frozen water in there and they uh you know, it's good for all sorts of things, frogs, um, loaches, 
angelfish, rams. They show on the package, obviously. But little fish will eat them, too. Little sparkling gouramis. Your bettas will love them. Um, obviously, guppies and live bears love them. Um, so they're a good thing for a lot of fish. And they're also good for some of your bigger fish, some of your bigger cichlids, your haplochromis or, you know, whatever you may have, um, mbunas and stuff. But you don't want to feed those bigger fish just these because they've been fed a certain diet um, and that diet is not necessarily reminiscent of the insects and worms you would they would eat in the wild. They've been given a vitamin-rich diet in some cases, which is nice. You can buy higher quality frozen food where they've been impregnated or dusted or it's been added on with calcium and other things just like you would in the reptile world, like with crickets. But... Um, in the end, whatever your your predatory fish eat, they're going to eat some sort of prey, and that prey eats other things. So even if you're thinking that your fish eats all meat, all protein, it's a puffer fish or whatnot, the bloodworms in the wild would have all sorts of, um, you know, other sorts of mulm and algae and uh, plant matter in their stomach uh, and in their bodies as well as what's in just their their the makeup of their their body so you have to remember that same with a big fish eating a little fish the little fish may be an algae eater so there are parts of their diet that we don't think about that are there that you need to account for and that's a lot of times where they're getting their trace uh, vitamins and minerals or even some of the things that color them up uh best a lot of the carotenoids and uh athetaskin and uh, xanthotaskin and uh, all the different pigmentation enhancers are found in these parts of of the the food chain now also in here that cube that's down there that's sunk now you saw it earlier it has daphnia now daphnia are not as big as the not as big as the brine shrimp they're kind of the size of a fruit fly if it was underwater uh, when they're full grown and uh they are an odd looking little critter that you could google if you want but we're going to make the first mix with this and i actually have to put on gloves to mix the blood worms uh they are very very commonly associated with allergic reactions and for me my whole body gets itchy my face my throat um anaphylaxis is even common one in three people will have an allergic reaction just from touching blood worms so be careful if you don't know how you'll react to those if you're new to feeding frozen um also another great one for your hardier big fish like my haplochromis or some of my big catfish uh, is beef heart. Uh, even angelfish, large adult angelfish, love this stuff. It's a little bit um, big and tough. So what I do is I don't mix this into the, the, the food so that the little fish have to tear it apart. But it's it's um, it's big old uh, chunks. Uh, and by that, I'm, I mean relative to the size of the fish. There may be a centimeter long in some cases. But it's kind of like if you had bacon bits or something in the tank and it's a little chewier a little more fat and protein and these ones are you know guaranteed 10 percent protein whereas we saw that the blood worms and the brine shrimp and stuff were somewhere in the two or four or three percent range and then mostly moisture so you're getting higher up in the protein range here uh and feeding beef heart uh they they like it but it's not always accepted right away so some people feed you know ground uh, chicken or shrimp or clams it just depends on your fish do your research find out what they like um, but universals are really daphnia brine shrimp and blood worms for frozen feedings so let's add the blood worms i'm going to get gloves on you guys don't need to see all that it's boring it's going to take time for me to pop out all the cubes and then the last thing we're going to add to this slurry here is this super carnivore mix which we're just going to add a few there's also vegetarian mixes depending on what kind of fish you have now those are usually for cichlids and things um, but see here again it's for fresh and saltwater fish this one's five percent protein but look at the ingredients it's really just more misi shrimp brine shrimp blood worms so that's essentially what we've already created here it's just it's in a nice cube so for feeding size it's an easy way to measure out this same mix however 
I like it because these cubes, uh, if you don't mash them up, they'll usually start sinking once they've thawed a bit, like these did. And I'll mix this all up, it'll stay more suspended, and then the bigger cubes, I'll avoid feeding those tanks that need the bigger protein, like the angel food, or the angel, um, <laughs> the angel tanks, uh, till the very end. So, and then we've got also the bigger packs of bloodworms too, which are just full uh, bloodworms up to two inches long, uh, inch or two inches long. And that um, the tiny fish will try to eat, but they can even choke on, like half beaks uh, are known to choke on those things or even thread fin rainbow fish. So be careful with feeding them too big of food that they do like, you know, cause they will try to eat it no matter what. Um, but, the way this floats in the water and is suspended, it doesn't sink right away, it's really good. It emulates the wild feeding process. So let's mix all this up and I'll meet you guys over at the tanks. Uh, the rest of the video is really just gonna be watching some pretty fish eating and uh, seeing how I get the food to them, their reaction to it when they've been eating dry food. I like using uh, a mix of dry food, both flake, uh, algae wafers or sinking pellets, and also crumbled granular food like uh, bug ball, bug bites by Fluval. That's just my particular preference because uh, I have a lot of gobies and nano fish, and I can crumble any one of those and let it float on the top, or I can suspend it in the plants if it sinks a little bit, um, or I can sink it all the way to the bottom and feed the plecos, the coris, all the kind of fish like that. So uh, let's skip ahead with the magic of editing. I'll see you in a sec. Also, I just thought I'd show you this real quick before we jump in. So there's also a uh, bio omega one. There's also cichlid food, which is kind of a mixture of stuff. Uh, if you look at it, it's got a real different um, feeding profile than the rest of the stuff we've looked at. It's got um, salmon, uh, shrimp, kelp, halibut, cod, spirulina, shrimp eggs, a uh, gel binder, which is probably just gelatin or pectin, and then it's got also a bunch of vitamins added to it. Uh, this one's 9% fiber, and as a cichlid food, usually, you know, it's got jewel cichlids on the front, it's got uh, jaguars, cribs, uh, blue tares, or, or green tares, or what whatnot. So they are kind of a wide-ranging diet, but this stuff comes out as a jello-like cube, even thicker than jello. So this actually has the texture of kind of clam, crab, or shrimp meat, kind of like a, a shellfish uh, meat. And so sometimes uh, I find that pea puffers and, and like Amazon puffers or figure eights or, you know, the smaller puffers, that they will eat this if you cut it into like four little pieces. You can toss it in there and they'll kind of rip at it like it, it were a snail or, you know, some sort of little uh, gastropod or... Um, shellfish so that's just another little hint so this usually only goes in one or two tanks and like i said it doesn't really dissolve because of that gel binder it stays as kind of chunks of flesh which is kind of what it was designed to do and it's kind of neutrally buoyant so if you've got plants that'll hang out in the plants uh and get tangled up and float and the fish can feed later or it'll kind of gradually sink and bob to the bottom over, you know, 20 minutes or so. So that's one thing. And then the other thing was uh, that this this is the small size, but you can buy these bricks of bloodworms also. Uh, this is for really if you have a fish room and you're going through a lot of bloodworms. Uh, these are a little easier for uh, the sake of uh, partitioning out the amount. So that's all. All right. Now, magic of editing. All right, let's take a look at some of the fish feeding here. So first of all, we have a cichlid tank. It's a bit of a mix of a cichlid tank because we've got these uh, beautiful ilungu or milungu from uh, Lake Victoria, but they are a enterochromus or haplochromus, basically a haplochromus that doesn't have a Latin name yet, but they're real pretty. Lawrence Kent caught these uh, in Africa himself when he went there not too many years ago, three years ago, I believe, two years ago, and he took the babies out of the mouth, their mouth brooders, of one of the mothers. Also in here, we've got uh, a large angelfish that's about five years old, and we have uh, some crebensis, and then we have some big old synodonus catfish that are hiding down in here somewhere, but they're a good six or seven inches long, and so what we did was we started, here was that cichlid food that I mentioned, 
it stays in a cube. Now, the big guys can actually eat this and they'll fight over it and it's not a problem. However, little fish, like over here in the Goody Ed tank, which are live bears, and also we've got pea puffers in here, um, in the back, if you see them, they hang out towards the sponge filter. They want snails, but they also like to switch it up. And this cichlid food that's gel-like up here, like I said, um, I'll have to cut that into four pieces with a little exacto knife, and then they'll rip it apart and eat it. Now, probably the most voracious fish I have for their size are these guys, these Turkana jewel cichlids from Lake Turkana. And you can you can sometimes just take the, the cichlid pellets and take, uh, I use my favorite tool in the entire fish room, which is a turkey baster. And I just mush it against surfaces, rocks or the glass or whatever, and break it up this way real quick. And you get some of these little flakes. That'll give them a taste for it. And then usually they'll come and feed. However, these guys are going mostly after the beef heart. Same thing with the turkey baster. Same tool. One tool, I like it. Uh, you can just go in there and uh, use the suction, then squirt it out. Use the suction, then squirt it out. And as it melts, it'll break apart into this kind of like tuna fish uh, consistency. And you can do it as many times as you want and kind of break it down smaller and smaller. Sometimes you just blast it with water a little harder and you can actually get um, some pretty small pieces and then that will help you. Like these pieces here might be small enough that we'll get some action on them. Uh, yeah, see even the goodyids are able to rip those apart and they don't even have beaks. Whereas the pea puffers, they've got those sharp beaks that will help them feed. So. A lot of people like to feed only blood worms uh, and snails to their puffers. I don't. Um, I think it can bind them up. And I just think in the wild, fish, if you watch them carefully, they're always up to something. And they they eat a lot more than just one or two things, with, with the exception of a few fish that are, you know, evolved to eat a monoculture of something. But now that we've got this broken up, let's try moving stuff out of the way. And let's get some right back to them. I like to use the turkey baster again because it is a, a great delivery device for food. So we've got all these little bits and pieces here, suck some of them up, and we'll just deliver the little bits back to the puffers, squeeze them out, and they've got them. Uh, missed it off camera, but the goodyids are kind of chasing them for it. But that's why I like to break up where I feed. So if you got some fish that are, if it's a species only tank, you know, I can feed all the beef heart right here and it's not a big deal. Um, like with these jewel cichlids because they're still eating the cube that fell farther back. But if you've got say like this tank here where we've got barbs and we've got rainbow fish and we've got uh, um, kissing garamis or uh, paradise fish, whatever you want to call them. They're not pink kissing gouramis, they're albino paradise fish if we're being uh, pedantic about it to some degree. But again, I just smush with, with this, like this, break it up. And the important thing is if they don't go for it, some fish won't go for this. Um, some fish won't go for blood worms for that matter. You can sometimes add garlic or paste of garlic, mush garlic, powdered garlic, whatever form you want. Uh, and sometimes that'll get a better response out of them for eating. Um, but gouramis are an interesting one. They eat a lot of tiny bugs all day. So they don't really want a big chunk of food all the time. But if they're hungry, like she was, she just took a big old chunk out of that. And they will actually eat off the bottom and rip away at the chunk sometimes if they're hungry enough. Um, or if they've been trained that that's how they're going to get their meal and tough luck. So... We've also done the same thing and put in these cubes instead of the slurry we made, which we'll look at again in just a second. But we've got this mixed tank, and we feed the big boys first, who are going to be super aggressive about eating. So in here we have a couple plecos. Um, we used to have the angelfish in here, and he used to be the big old hog. But now we have some buffalo head cichlids that are young. We have some pearl gouramis that are real fat, sorry about the water stains, uh, over on that side. And these pearl gouramis, as you can see, they're going after that 
they went after that food. And the buffalo head cichlid babies are gonna, as well as the uh, the uh, nanakara, the anom anom uh, animala, they're gonna go for any of this um, beef heart and stuff like that. Once it's in this size, they'll go for it. So it kind of gives you this hierarchy of who's gonna go for the food. And then your shire fish, especially if you've got a turkey baster or tweezers, then you can deliver it. I like turkey basters more because you can literally take food like this, break it up with the same tool. See, now we've got it broken up. And I can deliver it to that garami who's being alone in the back corner. Literally squirt it right over to them. And, uh, you know, you can get almost a foot of travel out of that sometimes. So we'll let them eat that, hang out, and do their thing. See, here they're not so interested in the cichlid bites as, as whole food. So we're going to mush it up too, just like we did everywhere else. See it's sinking. They're starting to, to, to bite and get interested, but it's still not, it, it's still not as choice as the beef heart or uh, that other uh, mixture of carnivore lovers that had all sorts of um, salmon protein and shrimp and basically stuff that's stinky and meaty, uh, which is what most fish that are carnivores or omnivores are going to go for. Now this, what's nice about this tank here, I try to keep some meat eating or at least omnivorous uh, fish at the bottom of every tank. So that way if the other fish miss it, it's not really a big deal. Here we can see a good example of what's in those carnivore cubes. So you can see the Mises shrimp and they look like little shrimp. Hold on. <laughs> you can see the brine shrimp and if we pull it apart with the turkey baster Now we can really see it and really mix up what's in there and we can deliver it to a few other tanks Which is what I do So you can see the blood worms are are medium-aged full-size blood worms But we can feed this to the live bears CPDs and bettas that are in this tank up here now if you're going to be sharing tank water like I just did though you want to make sure that the tanks are really healthy and you can account for uh, their health, you know, no, because um, you're, you're cross-contaminating the tanks when you do that, obviously. So we're also getting the, the beef heart out of here. The other thing is I like to feed in this order and of the bigger stuff, blood worms last because I'm allergic and uh, if I reach my hand in the tank even, I have trouble sometimes. So now we're gonna see, now that we broke that up, we're gonna see the barbs. We're gonna see the other fish come in and the big adult buffalo head cichlids, blue lip buffalo head cichlids for that uh, spe specificity, uh, they're all gonna come in. Whereas some of the smaller fire barbs and things may dart in and out. We've got some bumblebee catfish uh, that are also in here. Uh, we've got an apisto or a pair of apisto nicaea. Um, and the thing is, though, keep an eye on what cichlids are hanging out near a rock shelter too, because see this this pair, they're kind of um, what's the word? Already deciding that they're stuck over in their shelter. They may have eggs, so you don't want to contaminate the, the place where your pairs of fish or your your, um, your your fish that are monogamous are, but it doesn't hurt to give them a couple bites of food at the, the, the entryway. A lot of times their metabolism, their evolution will tell them, ah, don't eat, uh, you're protecting fry, that's it, and they, they won't even eat anyways, but it's worth giving a shot delivering them a little something special to their door. Uh, I like to always do that. Uh, and then, see, these smaller fish are eating the little bits and pieces that are around. Um, and they do a good job of that. But also when you've got floating plants or even just tall, uh, you know, root plants or fine leaf plants, or stem plants, rather, um, you'll find that then they catch a lot of bits and pieces. And if you've overfed, that can be... A real pain one to clean up but two just a real pain to have it all over but also um, you know oh here we go so see there we go the big buffalo head cichlid ate it so we also have one big male buffalo head cichlid that hasn't joined the party and I don't know what his deal is but again he may not have noticed or he may uh, have grabbed one cube and ran off I don't know what his deal is but 
We also want to not exclude him, so we want to make sure, or he could be guarding another, for that matter, he could be guarding one of these caves, the coconut or something else. So it's always good to go, then go back, grab some more of the debris. If, if there's an area where the cube sank, you can get more of the, the debris. Um, pick it up with the turkey baster again, and just trip by trip, here we go. Trip by trip, deliver some food, see if they're interested in it. Sorry about the, there we go. And he was, he came and ate it right away. So we'll definitely make sure when we spray all the blood worms and everything in, that we deliver some to him again too. So I just kind of keep an eye on all the fish, see what their appetites are like. You know, over here we've got um, chocolate garamis and we've got some of these really cool uh, Photo River out of, uh, well, Guiana in Africa. And they're a really nice fish. They're a really cool fish. They're like cribs uh, in their size and attitude and body uh, build and look. But they've evolved a bit differently and in a slightly different spot. But this is the first time I've ever fed them uh, this cichlid food. Sorry, guys. I know I'm probably not filming perfectly here. I'm trying to do two things with one hand, but let's see if they want any little pieces. Because in the future then we'll know we can chop these up or grind it up or whatever. But if he's not that interested or she's not that interested in it, um, and these are Enigmatochromius, uh, Enigmatochromus, uh, and then their, uh, their actual name has kind of been in debate uh, of the species, but uh, Lucansii or Lucansii. Uh, and here's the male over here. I want to squeeze him a couple. And he's been already eating them, so... So it looks like they are going to try the cichlid food. Not their favorite thing in the world, though. And that, that's okay. Also, your, your snails and, sh and shrimp and other critters in your tank may end up liking one of these things a whole lot. So it's, it's good to try it out, too. Like, I'll put it up here in this other tank, and we'll see who's interested. Um, and... I bet you anything, all my albino ram's horns that I grow out there, or in the bronze ram's horn tank, they'll eat it. They'll eat it for sure. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the general way we go. And then, once we've got all this delivered, so to speak, into their tanks, we've also got in here, we've got one of those carnivore pellets, break it up. But we can also take bits of it, because it's, it's pretty dense together, but you can suck some of it up and then share it, say, like, this is my wild betta colony, my little, well, it was going to be a sorority, but it looks like there's one male with them, too, but those are big worms, but look at, they'll go for them, they're, they're a, a hard striking fish, so, uh, they'll go for it, they can get bloated, they can have issues with it, but, uh, for the most part, they can handle it as long as you're not giving them too many. If they try to do two or three in one sitting, that's when they can get bound up and they can have stomach problems and everything else. But, yeah. So, wild bettas, uh, they're, they're pretty savage sometimes. Also, these are the Epistogramma, uh, Trilineatus, uh, ro Rodiker, and then we've also got my little, uh, Stiphodons. Now, I have about 10 species of Stiphodons, and they will only eat the bug bites and the biofilm generally, but they will mouth some of this other food just to kind of see, like, what's up? What is that? Um, sometimes they'll eat a blood worm, uh, but usually it has to be broken into pretty small pieces. Now, right now, we're just literally stirring this. I know this video is going pretty long, but I want to do a thorough tutorial. So then we've got some betta that I'm priming for breeding back here. So we'll give them a, a good dose of blood worms. Plus, there's some live bears in there. Uh, so they'll have those to munch on later. Here, we're just going to uh, up the density of blood worms. But we're also entering all that little stuff. And this is where uh, the coolie loaches in here, the shrimp, the other... Um, the other apistos in here, they're all going to eat that. But even more important than what a given apisto is eating, and you can see how this separated, like I was saying, this is all that teeny food for the nano fish. So we can feed like the madakas and the the ruby uh, tetras and, and things like that. We can just feed them that without the bloodworms if we want. Whereas over here, we've got the mix, 
they'll eat some of it and if it's not all eaten or if the snails rather don't eat it in within a few hours on this day since it's only every few days that I do the frozen diet then we'll go back and we'll kind of decide okay how much did we dose so we do two cubes in there all right let's cut back next time that kind of thing but in here they've eaten a lot of the food that was put in initially in those cubes yet these little barbs uh rosy barbs will tear apart the blood worms and and swarm so will the rainbow fish the dwarf rainbow fish praycocks and sometimes the the gouramis will gouramis like i said they can be fickle in what they're going to eat what day same with pea puffers and goodyids these goodyids will eat the the they'll definitely eat these uh worms and the Turkana jewel cichlids already were eating the beef heart, the cichlid stuff. I mean, they're going to eat anything we put in their tank. They're just going to uh, wolf down. So they're, they're ones that I never have to worry about. Again, we're putting new food in, uh, and boom, do you see that cichlid coming in for it? So if they eat this, this uh, <laughs> kind of gleefully, uh, it, it really allows you to know, all right, well, I can put a good amount in there. But don't get overzealous and overfeed. Um, you, you need to kind of learn over time what a good amount is. It's good for the food to mostly be gone within two to four minutes if they're bigger fish, maybe five. Uh, and then if you have a whole ecosystem where you've got some shire fish and things, they may come out at night and eat. Like here, that crib is coming out, but it's teeny compared to the haplochromus. So even just holding its own is an accomplishment. So I'm actually going to get some more blood worms. And some of the, the finer particles that we're putting into the water in the form of Daphne and stuff that looks so dirty here, don't ever put it near your filter because it'll just suck it up and run it into the filter floss and it'll go to waste. But if you uh, put it in the water, it'll also tell the fish, hey, there's little food. So that'll help them in there. Uh, in their kind of instinctual patterns. It'll help them trigger to spawn. So we're going to take some of this, the last thing we're going to do on film, we're going to take some of this uh, stuff without the blood worms, and we're going to feed like this tank, which has one of the smallest fish in the hobby, these little uh, African uh, ember or amber barbs, and we're just going to feed them. We're going to disperse this all over. Again, I'm trying to breed them. So live brine shrimp are going to be the best, but they're happy to eat any of this material, uh, any of these teeny little brine shrimp, Daphnia or, or Mises shrimp. Uh, they're going to go ahead and eat that. It takes them some time, and they don't eat a whole lot of it because they're tiny. So, I mean, think about how much the fish weighs. Same with, like, my killifish tank or the brand-new fry tank. Uh, they can only eat so much. So, I mean, think about their body, the weight, and think about your body weight. And, okay, how many, how many, could you eat an entire Thanksgiving turkey? No? Well, then don't put an entire Thanksgiving turkey proportionally into their food supply for the, de for the night. Um, you know, so that's just one more thing to think, think of. But, like, these chocolate grommies, they'll go after the, the blood worms. They're a little shy, so I like to kind of, hide them around the tank, put them in things. That's why there's just, this makes your fish work for food. Um, like a dog playing with a dog toy, honestly. Some fish, if they're bored, quote unquote, they will start bugging other fish. And so this is actually a good way to disperse that violence, is to just put food all over the place. It helps the shy fish, and then we'll take the last bit of really suspended stuff, and we'll just let that drift which is what the smallest fish are going to eat and for the next 20 minutes some of these shy fish are going to come in and start uh, eating stuff the gouramis like to work for their food so they're going to come in and they're going to eat these out of here for the next half hour those lotus pods are great the dried lotus pods for that reason same with up here in the baby gourami tank or baby beta tank rather they also are thinking fish, just like puffers and cichlids. They really do kind of study their prey, and they want to think about it and do a little bit of work to, to get it. Otherwise, their their day is boring. So that's what I wanted to show you guys, and I hope that helps you and answers pretty much any question you might have about feeding frozen food. So that's how I do it. Not saying it's the right 
wrong, best, better, worst way or anything, but it's just a way to do it. It's a way I've found to work pretty well for breeding fish and also just also just maintaining biomes. Feed on the lighter side and maybe only twice a week or something like that if, if you're not trying to breed and you're just trying to keep an ecosystem stable. Um, fish can survive on surprisingly low amounts of food. Uh, you don't want to starve them, but they can... They can do really well with the little critters that live in their tanks uh, and the food you give them. So you don't need to overdo it. Uh, other things like live bears and guppies, though, they'll eat and eat and eat until they don't even know what's good for them. Uh, so it's kind of up to you to, to police that. And it's up to you to decide when they're old enough to be eating, say, a bunch of bloodworms. So, like, these adults, I don't care if they have bloodworms, but... Um, I also want them to get some of the littler stuff so they don't have just one and then, you know, upset stomach. Because they'll definitely, even the little ones, will go for one blood worm and think that they've got a prize. And then they'll s struggle with it for 20 minutes and actually not get any food in the scheme of things because they're so busy doing that. So, I just like to make sure everybody's getting fed. All right, guys, sorry about the bad videography while I'm doing things with two hands. Here's my patchwork, guppy coals. But, uh, yeah, they're doing well, and uh, sometimes good stuff comes out of this coal tank, too. So I like to feed them well as also. All right, guys, I will talk to you later. If you like this, let me know. If you need to know any details or if I missed something, please drop it in the comments. And also, if there's a product that you like that I didn't touch on today, I'd love to hear about it. Um, if there's something better, uh, I know there's also things like, you know, gelatin foods like rapashi and stuff. Uh, and I might do a whole episode just on those. Uh, but if you want good color, good mating activity, and, and uh, very energetic, healthy fish, you got to do some of this uh, frozen, frozen food or live food. It really does make a huge difference. I'll talk to you guys later next time on The Secret History, living in your aquarium.